Afternoon everyone, welcome to the third practical. This will be the load cell, the actual calibration of it. So this is what the typical load cell will actually look like. You now know how to actually um, calculate the full scale of this. This is what was done at the last practical. We took all the measurements, did all the calculations, worked out what type of resolution that we have. That is all theoretical values. So what happens if we actually wind up? How well does those values or performance of this instrument compare to what we actually calculated for the other practical? So I've drawn a few diagrams here to explain exactly how the practical will work, how we're going to wire up this load cell. This is something that's quite a challenge uh, in the years prior as well. So we want to do a bit more in-depth explanation so it's a bit more clear. So to go one step back, what we have over here is our load cell. There's actual um, strain gauges that you can see on there. It's very thin film resistors and these are connected to wires to the connectors which we'll explain in a moment. So we have our Wheatstone bridge over here, again giving a small uh, output value. We just represent that as a sinusoidal signal for this example. Then we amplify the signal by 495 times using the amplifier, so that's the amplification factor. If we have a look over here on the Arduino itself, this is the amplifier shield. So there you can see we can connect up to two load cells simultaneously, and this just connects to the Arduino itself. So once we have this amplified signal, we put it through again the analog to digital converter and we get a digitized output value. So from analog going to digital. So similar to the potentiometer practical of a few weeks ago, we can again draw something like this. If we take this amplified um, UA value we get from the amplifier, we input this into the ADC, we can read a corresponding digit value on the output side over here. So Similar to the uh, potentiometer practical, our instrument has changed a little bit and we can do uh, more complex calculations uh, to this end. So, just a few things that I want to go over. Okay, so in the last practical, you did a lot of calculations exactly uh, which elements of the load cell that you receive, where they should plug into your Wheatstone bridge configuration. So for this example, I just uh, came up with my configuration as shown on the sketch. And if we have a closer look on the load cell, you're welcome to take a pencil. So I marked it over there with a 2, a 4 on the one side, and then the other side there's a 1 and a 3. And these numberings correspond to our design over here, which we'll use in the wiring of our load cell. So a very important thing, don't rely on the colors of the wires that we're going to use to define how you need to wire your Wheatstone bridge, stick to the numbering scheme, mark it on the load cell, it makes life a lot easier. Okay, so a bit more on the physical connectors on how we want to connect the load cell. What we currently have with this one in its current state is something similar to this. Each one of these uh, strain gauges, you'll see there's two thin wires going to one of these terminal blocks. So uh, two columns corresponds to one of these strain, gauge, uh, yeah, strain gauges and then the other one here you can see the yellow wire running that's to the left hand side. So if we draw this in a picture, so on the top and the bottom we have a, sort of an identical uh, component layout and using the top one as an example, so with the one strain gauge over here one of the legs is connected to this column and the other leg is connected to that column. But you'll notice it's actually a double row of connectors because we need to share this electrical connection with other points in our circuit. So at the back, you'll see this is indicated by the dotted lines. These two ports over here are electrically connected. If you have a careful look on the back, it's actually soldered physically together so they form the same electrical potential. And that's important for when we start wiring the load cell itself. So in its current state, we have these four strain gauges and none of, none of them are actually physically connected in any way or manner. This all depends on what we did for our initial design and uh, yeah, so we designed it and now we need to wire it up. So according to our standard Wheatstone bridge model, if I can call it that, we have the excitation. Note it's 3.3 volts. We also need to add the reference voltage jumper on the shield. We'll show you in a moment about that. We have E minus or the ground potential, zero volts. It's just the way that it's uh, named E minus in this instance. Uh, then we have, just to uh, make this a bit more clear, 
we have s plus and s minus just to stick to the convention and then ua or the differential voltage of course is measured across these two points so this is for the load cell if we again go back to the the amplifier shield you also see in the notes on page 56 uh, there's a figure over there that indicates it also nice and clearly uh, so drawing it out on the board over here if we have one of these connectors from the left to the right this is the connections that we need to make on this board it's E minus or ground signal plus signal minus so just reference back to that sketch if you're wondering what's what and then of course E plus or VCC or the positive voltage connection so we need to sort of merge or marry these two together using the wires that we are provided with so the easiest and most straightforward way that we found to actually do this whole procedure is to start from a single point and work our way around either clockwise or anti-clockwise. The direction really doesn't matter. Okay, so I'm going to multitask a bit over here. So we want to hook up using this configuration and for convenience sake, the standard uh, model R1 equals the number over there, R2 equals R2. R3 equals R3 and R4 equals R4. So make sure you draw this out for yourself to help you actually wire this, otherwise it gets very confusing. So let's start at the top. We need to connect these two legs together and this must also be connected to the positive voltage over there. So first we're going to start off any leg or connection of R1, in other words R1 on this load cell, we want to connect to any leg of R4, in this case, also number 4 on this load cell. So I'm going to draw in that connection now, and there you can see we're connecting those two. So physically what we now need to go and do, we're going to take uh, one of the jumper wires, and I'll try to get this in focus, so any one of R1, so you'll see R1 over here, it's this connection, so any leg, either either that color or that one so we just follow the legs and I'm gonna choose this one over here again top or bottom connections doesn't matter because they are electrically connected to the same potential so this is one leg of R1 and to any leg of R4 which will be on the other side of the load cell so I'm gonna turn it around and there we can see R4 it's over here on the bottom so we again just have to carefully follow these two colors and any leg of this uh, strain gauge. You'll see as we reach the end the number of available options sort of vanish and everything works out in the end. So that's our very first connection or electrical connection. But there's one thing we're missing still here. We now need to also connect the positive 3.3 volts with this terminal on our amplifier shield. So I'm going to take a longer jumper wire and E positive sits in this example on the right hand side. So let's draw that one in. And now I'm again physically going to take the wire, so you'll see there's some longer wires here as well. You just connect two of them together to have a polarity with male and female connectors. Now we have a look again at our shield over here, and we know the right-hand side one is the E plus connector. So I'm just making sure that it fits nice and snugly on there. Don't force it too much, otherwise the pins, uh, uh, pins will bend. So that's in there. And again, this is the same electrical potential, E positive. So I can either connect it on the top over there or on the top over there. So I'm just going to pick one and connect it like that. Okay, so I'm going to put this down now and just with the camera pointing back. So we completed this connection. Okay, so let's move along the circuit. So one leg of R4 is now connected. There's only one remaining. So this remaining leg we need to connect to any one of R3. So it's a very similar pattern. So we need to make that connection. Remaining leg R4 to any one of R3's connection. So I'm going to take another one of these jumpers over here. So look carefully, it will not be this connection over here. This is the one leading to E+. So just holding that pointing back to the board, this is that connection. So it's not that one. It will be the other side of the leg and we will then again see there's R4 so the other leg of R4 is the yellow wire over there so I'm just going to connect it adjacent to that one again top or bottom just helps if you stay on the same row over there for now 
um, so the remaining leg of R4 to any leg of R3 which is again sitting on the other side so R3 is this one over here we just follow it so it's one of these two connections let's just use any leg of that one so any leg of R3 is that one it's this uh, electrical connection now looking back at the board again we want to connect the S minus terminal over here to S minus on our amplifier shield over here so the one adjacent where we already have one wire so let's do that so I'm going to take another one of these so the uh, S minus on the amplifier shield over here connect it over there just put this back in if the, uh, they don't want to stay properly connected just ask for some replacement wires so we're still working with this connection over here so the uh, connection over here just looking back at the board it's going to be this one so this is where I'm connecting S minus any leg of R3 if I can call it that to the remaining leg of R4 okay so there we have uh, so that's R3 just get my own bearings straight here so the only remaining leg of R4 it's going to be this one this one over there okay so we there we have that connection I'm going to draw it on the board to make sure we know that it's complete take it around on that side okay so we're going to do the last remaining connection the remaining leg of R3 to any leg of R2 the remaining leg of R3 is still this one so it's on that side the remaining leg of R3 to any leg of R2 any leg of R2 that's still the only one that's available so that's R2 without showing the board again I'm just gonna explain so um, R2 uh, just to get my bearings also straight so the, the last leg of R3 that's connected now to R2 and we also need to connect the E minus over here and this is on the left hand side of the amplifier shield okay so R3 the remaining leg of R3 so again it's easy just to to follow the wires around so that's R2 uh, R3 So that's R1, and then we connect it. So that's going to be the uh, leg of R2. And now I'm confused myself. So that's going to be R2. So that's any connection of R2. Okay, so it's going to be the side. So there we go, connection to R3 that's been shared with R2 and then we need to connect it to E- minus, which sits on the left hand side right over there. Okay, there it's in there. Okay, so those connections are complete as well to E- minus, and then the last one we have the remaining leg of R1 with the remaining leg of R2 and you'll see when you look at the load cell this will magically appear if you look at it from the top that's the remaining leg of R1 and on the opposite side that column is empty that's the remainder of R2 so now all we need to do we connect the remainder of the connections R1 with R2 which is this electrical potential and the last wire to connect to the amplifier will then be is positive in this case so I'm just juggling a little bit over here so I'm just gonna put that wire right in there and then this must be connected to the white wire that electrical potential so I'm just looking for a empty slot so there's the white wire I'm just gonna move it one down so we have some space to actually put it in there we go and then that one goes there 
So that's then, in effect, the load cell that is um, completed in terms of its wiring scheme. And if we look on the board, we just connect with that one too, is positive over there. So this is the Wheatstone bridge, as we noted it down over here, we connected everything to the amplifier shield. The one thing we mustn't remember is the V-Ref jumper. So standard, Arduino Unos normally use a 5 volt reference, but because we're only getting 3.3 volts from the shield connectors themselves, we just need to set the V-Ref to 3.3 volts as well. So that's why you'll see you'll have some extra jumpers. So on the top of the shield, you will be able to see a ref over there. It's S C L S D A and then a ref. So third one from the right from my position. And we then connect that to the 3.3 volt connector over there. And that's the fourth one from the right from my position. So this physically sets the V ref to 3.3 volts. So we're going to cut the video over here and in the remainder of the section we're going to show you how we actually put the little hanger on the load cell itself, how we flash the new code to the load cell and then how we can start taking readings to do the actual calibration of the load cell. Cool. Okay everyone, we're back with the second part of the practical. So we have our load cell wired up here on the table. We're just going to use this as a demonstration. So for your particular load cell, if you carefully hold it in, in the light, and I'll just try and reflect it, I hope it picks up on camera, there's about a 60 or 70 uh, millimeter uh, distance between the edge of the load cell and the line that has been scored across the metal. So it is this point that needs to be clamped tightly to a table surface. So in the venue of 37 that you guys will be present most likely, uh, you will see on the table it's actually thin enough that we can do it with the G-clamp right at that position because this is the effective length that we've worked with in our calculations this far so it's important that we support it the correct way for this demonstration only this distance will be significantly shorter owing to the small table that we have over here so we take the G-clamp just put it on a table over here and then we carefully slide the load cell across like that it's normally a two-person job, but this table makes it a bit easier. And I'm going to clamp it tight and firm, like that, so it's not going anywhere. So you'll see it's quite stiff like that. There we go. Um, so there's everything wired up. This is what we did in the first part of the video. I've already hooked this up to my computer. So if you look in the notes, you will see that on page 59, I've provided the code. You can directly download this as an INO file for Arduino using that link. Alternatively, we just copy all of this. We open a new Arduino window. For this example, it's just a simple blink sketch. So I'm going to say Control all selecting all the text, and I'm just pasting that code over everything else. So there is everything. Just make sure that we save this somewhere, uh, anywhere on your computer. I'm just going to save this on my desktop as practical 3 over there. So there's the code. Again, on the bottom right hand side, note that we're selecting the Arduino Uno and on the correct COM port over there. So there we can see the Uno and it's picked up on my computer on that COM port. Perfect. So now I'm just going to click, uh, before I click the upload button, you will see on line 5 float frequency 10. So this sets the number of times per second the data is being sent to the computer that will graph and view shortly. If you're only interested in viewing numbers, a slow frequency of 1 to 2 hertz is sufficient. If you want something graphically to see dynamic effects, we can go for 100 hertz. So for now I'm just going to leave it at 10 hertz as an in-between point for demonstrating and then I'm going to upload the code over there. So we're just going to give that a second. Okay, it's done uploaded. Uh, I'm going to open the serial monitor over there and you should see something a value between 0 and 1023. Preferably this should be around the 500 mark but 300 for this example is also fine. If we need to adjust it please call one of the technicians or help, uh, helping guides and you will see there's a small little potentiometer on here. Please do not adjust this yourself, they are very fragile and they do break easily. So one of the uh, assistants will have a small screwdriver. Once you have your configuration hooked up to the table like this, ask one of them to just assist you so we can uh, change the, the bias value so it's closer to the middle. 
So in some cases, this, for example, will read 0 or 1023, even though your load cell is actually configured correctly. So just put up your hand if you're unsure. So this is typically uh, what you'll see in the box. This is a little hanger, as we call it. And this will be used to calibrate your load cell. So I'm just looking there. We have the other nut. So walking over to on this side, you will see the nut over here is red. That's clamped on tight over there. So I'm going to take off one of these washers. There's two. So removing it like this. I'm going to put it through the load cell, put the washer on top. And then just with one or two turns, add the nut over there. So now you'll see the hangers on there. So you will get your own weights. You will need to weigh them off. And you will, of course, have your um, full scale already provided by one of the, um, the uh, on the practical paper itself from practical two. So we will provide this value to you. Make sure you do not exceed that value. The metal is quite thin and it can actually start to bend if you load it too much. So I've just got some demonstration weights over there. So if you want to load it on the load cell, just keep it steady like that. Load it on there and don't let it swing too much. Just keep it still like that. And you can add more and more weights and you'll see with the practical, four to five weights will normally be sufficient. You can calculate the sort of the size of the weights that you will uh, need for your own calibration purposes. There will also be a scale to weigh these off exactly. So you'll see it starts hanging a little bit and there we go. So just to illustrate the actual effect what's happening as we load this, I'm going to take the weights off and I'm going to turn the computer so we can see it a bit better over here. So currently the value that we're reading over there is uh, 260 and it stays pretty constant. There's a bit of electrical noise in the system. So that's why our accuracy is not exactly one digit necessarily. And I'm just going to add a single weight over here. So there we go. I'm going to add that. And it actually goes down to 130. If it turns out to be negative, don't worry. We don't matter to worry too much about the sign itself. We can simply go to the uh, amplifier shield over here. We can take the center two terminals or the outer two terminals. Outer ones are normally a bit easier to adjust. And we're just going to simply swap them. So what that does is we effectively adding a minus sign in front of our formula of UA over UE equals K divided by 4 that old story and then we should have something a bit better so now we add 370 I'm just going to remove the white quickly here and there you can see 250 roundabouts I'm going to add one weight over here and you'll see it goes up to 370 adding the third weight again now it's showing around about 500 and the final weight it's around about 630. If we want to view this graphically, which shows it a bit better, I'm going to serial plotter, maximizing this window. So I'm just going to open it again. I'll see the axis is a bit off. There we go. So you'll see it's around about 600 digits of all three weights added. I'm going to take off one. There we go. So there you can see it going down. I'm taking off the second weight now. There it goes down a bit further and then finally taking the last way down you will see a new reading over there the interesting phenomena that we can also observe is if we take off this hanger and this will most probably be one of the practical questions so i'm just going to close this down on the frequency i'm going to increase this to 100 hertz so we get a lot more uh, or faster feedback it's currently uploading the code. I'm going to open up the serial plotter again. And you'll see a lot of data coming in there. So now I'm going to actually just flick the ruler like this without any mass. And you will see on the computer screen there you can actually see the dampening of it. And in addition, you can calculate the natural oscillating frequency of this as well. Because it's basically a beam hanging or uh, in, the, in a cantilever fashion. So the easiest way to do this, I'm going to close that. We open the uh, serial monitor again. I'm going to hold the ruler still. I'm going to flick it once. You'll see the values rapidly fluctuate. And I'm just going to rip out the USB cable like this. 
bone damage to the Arduino in any way. I can select all the data. If I click on the window, Control A, I'm going to copy this data. I'm going to open up Microsoft Excel or any other spreadsheet utility. I'm going to paste the data over there. I'm going to add a new column, a new row. So we know that this is the digit value. This is time in seconds, and it's going to be 0 0.01 because we're working at a frequency of 100 hertz. So we're just going to populate this column like so. And then we can also graph it on Excel. And then we can start zooming in on data to actually uh, calculate the natural oscillating frequency. Um, so you'll see some interesting effects due to resonance actually happening on this scale. And I'm just checking to see if everything is fine. If you see something like this, you can also try increasing the frequency. Um, this is most likely odd overlapping effects happening over here. But normally, you'll see the nice sinusoidal uh, oscillating curve on the graph. So you can use that to answer the practical. So that's all from my side. I think we've covered most of the topics. If there's any other questions, please go back in the video. If you're still unsure, please ask one of us or one of the um, assistants during the practical uh, if there's anything that is unclear. So for future reference, come back to this video. This is recorded in 2020, but for all the practicals, it should stay the same. Enjoy the practical.